Hey everyone, welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C, and we're going to do some more A&P today. Specifically, we're going to continue our run through histology. I'll be looking at muscle tissue and nervous tissue. Let's do it. So here's a classic picture of nervous tissue. You see this giant octopus looking guy here. This is called a neuron, N-E-U-R-O-N. -E That's a neuron that is a cell of the nervous system. Around it, you may see little dots. Those are going to be support cells of the nervous system called glia. And there are many different ways to talk about it that you can say that they're neuroglia or even add an L to the end of it and talk about glial cells. Nerves are different than neurons. I want to be clear here. Neurons are the cells like I see here in this picture. That's not a nerve, though. And nerve is not going to be shown anywhere on this talk. I'll save nerves for much, much later. It's a bundle of neurons that's wrapped in connective tissues. Neuroglia, again, are the little support cells, the network cells that surround the main neurons. Function, of course, is to transmit electrical impulses. Sometimes these are called action potentials, a word that we'll use to describe them in the future. And of course, we would find these where we expect to find them in the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves running through your arms and your legs and your torso called the peripheral nerves. Tricks to this, I see kites flying in the sky. You may not see that, but if this is the string, let me get a, a color that really stands out here. If this is the string, then this would be kind of the triangular looking kite. Right, and sometimes you can see multiple kites flying and the strings are getting all tangled up together. Some people call this an octopus party because they see the neuron as being an octopus and there'll be many of them kind of floating in the ocean together. Out here, these little tree branches are actually called little trees. Dender is the root for tree, so we can call them dendrites. And the function of dendrites are to receive information. So I often draw my receptor symbol out here to show that they're receiving information from some source. Could be from another neuron, could be some out from the outside world, or whatever it may be. They're going to pass that information on to this kite here, the main kind of triangular diamond-shaped little thing here called the body. There are other terms for this. A pericarion, you could call it the centrum, but most books, when they start off, they call that the cell body. And inside, you can see the nucleus, you can see the squiggles of the endoplasmic reticulum, you can see the jelly beans, the uh, mitochondria in there that are generating ATP that this uh, cell definitely needs a lot of. It's going to pass that information down this way that it's received from the dendrites along this long kind of like the string of the kite. This is called the axon. You can remember that by thinking of the axle of your car as the long pole that holds the tires on, right? So the axon, that should be an O. It kind of looks like I put an E there, but this is an axon. And it does send information in one direction away from the cell body. Now these little blue things are optional. The axon doesn't have to have these. Uh, these are called myelin sheaths. So one would be a myelin sheath. It's, it's a type of fat and it's wrapped around acting as electrical insulation. And if the function of these neurons is to send or transmit electrical impulses, it's good sometimes to have a myelin sheath so you can get rapid uninterrupted transmission. Now at the other end we have what are called synapses usually. Now a synapse implies that there is something else on the other side connecting to it, receiving information from it. Information will jump across something like this. So sometimes this is just called an axon terminal, although there are other terms for it as well, an axon terminal. Terminal meaning the end right? The terminus of the axon. And there's the basic labeling of a neuron. Perfect picture of nervous tissue. I see the giant cell body here. Kind of looks like an octopus swimming in the water. 
Uh, where's the axon? Probably here. And then I can see here and here and here sticking out are probably dendrites. Around the tissue, I can see these glial cells or these neuroglia that will support the network. Where would I find this? Brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves. Another octopus picture. Again, we see the big kind of diamond-shaped kite that's flying. These are probably the dendrites out here. And this is somewhere in here is probably the axon leading away. It's kind of hard to tell. The dots all around it are the neuroglia. One more time. Octopus swimming in the middle. Where's the axon? Kind of hard to tell here, but I see it looks like there's an axon of another one. Here's an axon of another one, kind of intertangled, like the kite strings have gotten tangled. And then the purple dots everywhere are the neuroglia. So let's check out the first of the three muscle types called skeletal muscle. On the bottom of this image, I've put a bunch of pipes stacked up. And if you can get this idea of pipes stacked in bundles, you're getting a really good idea of what skeletal muscle tissue looks like. So the pink stuff that's above that would be three pipes that are stacked together. So pipe-like, elongated, meaning we have very long cells like a pipe. Striated, you can see the stripes, and that's something that's missing from the pipes below. If I could put some you know, ribs on the pipes like this, this would be probably a better representation of what it actually looks like, but a striation is just a stripe or a line. So you should see clear striations, and you should see that the cells have multiple nuclei per cell. Sometimes they're pushed over to the side like that. So elongated, striated, multinucleate, three excellent words that describe skeletal muscle. You are in control of this, most of the time anyway. Meaning you decide if you want to move your arm up, you decide if you want to smile, you decide if you want to sit up or lay down. It's usually your choice. Now there are some examples like when you shiver and you're really cold, you'll lose control of your skeletal muscle and it will start to contract involuntarily to generate heat. But for the most part, skeletal muscle is considered to be a voluntary type of muscle that moves the bones. That's why it's called skeletal muscle because this muscle pulls the bones. So where would we find it? Attached to the bones. Although we do find this like in the face, sometimes attached to the skin. The herringbone pattern, again, the stacks of pipes, whatever works for you, this one's usually not missed ever, except for the people that just don't study at all. But these elongated, striated, multinucleate cells, classic skeletal muscle. Beautiful. We see a stack of pipes here. I see the striations very clearly. I see the multiple nuclei in the cell very clearly. Where would I find this? Attached to the bones or skin. What's the function? To move the bones or the skin. Another one, I see five pipes here. Each of them are ribbed. I can see the striations very clearly. And I can see the multiple nuclei. Cardiac muscle. Similar but different, right? Let me flip back to the skeletal picture and then flip forward again to the cardiac picture. All right, similar but different. So let's talk about similarities. Well, I see striations. I still see the striations, but that's about it. Let's see what's different now from the skeletal muscle. Bifurcations. Very hard to see in many of the pictures. If I can get like a yellow here, that tissue looks like it's making a Y. It's split. And then right here, it's split again. That's a bifurcation. A bifurcation is a forked tongue or a forked tail, like a bird with a bifurcated tail or a snake with a bifurcated tongue. Bifurcation just means that it splits into Ys. On really good pictures, you can see this. When the tissue is all smooshed together, it's harder to see the bifurcations. But cardiac muscle is striated and bifurcated. It's still multinucleate, but the giveaway, the absolute giveaway that I'm looking at cardiac muscle, that is muscle that, that's inside the heart, are these dark staining bands that are perpendicular to the way the pipe is running. Kind of the same direction that the striations are running, but they're much darker. And I see them all over the place. Those are called inter 
intercalated discs. Some people pronounce them intercalated discs. Potato, potato, in my opinion. If you can spell it and get it right on a test, it doesn't matter how you say the word. So there are some intercalated discs. This is going to ensure that we get good electrical signal passed from one neighbor to another. We don't want some of the heart contracting when it's time to contract. We don't want some of the heart beating. We want the whole thing to beat in a rhythm. So we have to communicate with the cells around it using these intercalated discs. Another difference between it and skeletal muscle is that cardiac muscle is involuntary. You have no control over your heart muscle. You can't consciously make it beat faster or slower. Now you can run in place and it will speed up of course, but you can't, you know, that's a different type of manipulation altogether. Your brain is causing that to happen, not you consciously. Location, one spot and one spot only. You will never find cardiac muscle in a blood vessel. You will only find it in the heart and you will only fi find it in the myocardial layer of the heart. Myo, the root word for muscle. So only in the layer of the heart that actually does the squeezy, squeezy business. And of course, we'll talk about that a lot more when we get to the heart chapter. Tricks, those dark staining intercalated discs that are in between the cells are an immediate giveaway that you are looking at cardiac muscle. Another beautiful picture of cardiac muscle, I can see the striations. I can sort of see a bifurcation, but again, it's always not the greatest on images. But I can see dark staining bands in between the cells. These are intercalated discs, and to me that's the giveaway. Function, well, make the heart squeeze. Location, the myocardium of the heart. Another one, again, this is sandwiched together and it could be confusing. Like if you're trying to find a pattern, I don't really see bifurcation. The striations are there, but they're a little washed out. But what I do see definitely all over the place are these dark staining bands perpendicular to the way that the fiber is running. And I see them all over the place and it's a giveaway. I'm looking at cardiac muscle. A little bit darker, bifurcations are apparent. Multinucleation apparent, striation apparent, but again, to me, the intercalated discs are going to be the easy answer to this tissue, instantly recognizable. Smooth muscle is the last type of muscle. We talked about skeletal muscle moving the bones. We talked about cardiac muscle allowing the heart to pump. Smooth muscle is a little bit different as well. To draw a single smooth muscle cell, I would put a big nucleus in the center and I would make that middle bulge out. I would have tapering edges kind of like that. And it sort of reminds me of a UFO from a 1950s cartoon or comic book or something like that. But there are no striations. And these form tightly packed sheets, which can be confusing and you could get this confused with stratified squamous epithelium, but in really good pictures, there will not be an apical surface to confuse you. So this is involuntary. You are not in control of smooth muscle. Your brain and other parts of your body will send signals to it to tell it to squeeze. So where do we find this? Well, we find it in the hollow or tubular organs, and this allows us to push material through those hollow or tubular organs. And the way that material is pushed through is called peristalsis or peristaltic propulsion. Something we'll see much later when we get into the digestive system. So any tubular or hollow organ like blood vessels, like the stomach, like your guts, your intestines where food is moving through, that is being pushed along by these rhythmic, slow and steady waves of peristalsis. Tricks, flying saucers, kind of hard, right? Let me kind of highlight, there's a cell, bulging middle. Here's another cell with it with a bulging middle. Here's a cell here with a bulging middle and tapered edges, bulging middle and tapered edges. This is classic smooth muscle. Another picture of smooth muscle. Again, the question becomes very important when you're taking an exam. Why is this not stratified squamous? I mean, I see many layers of squash cells, 
But what's missing? Well, remember, if you're trying to find stratified squamous, that's an epithelial tissue, you need to do ABCs. Is there an A? Is there an apical surface? Nope. Is there a B? Is there a basement? Nope. Is there C? Is there connective tissue underlying this? Nope. So it fails all the ABCs. Yes, they're tightly packed, but that's the only thing that it has in similarity with stratified squamous. If it doesn't have the ABCs, it can't be epithelium. Smooth muscle again. Tightly packed. Squash flat cells, but no apical, no basement, no connective tissue. Where would I find these? Lining the walls of tubular or hollow organs. What's the function? Slow rhythmic propulsion through peristalsis. More smooth muscle. All right, that was a quickie, but the nervous system and the muscle system when it comes to histology is pretty easy. Thanks for watching that one. If you wish, check out the other videos in the series. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.